Well, this morning I have um, a message that I actually have done through Bible research an awful lot of. And um, I want you to understand that this message, I believe, is a prophetic forerunner message. That is just as much a prophetic message as when I shared with you many times that I sit down and I do dictation. I literally receive messages by dictation. Just sit down and the Lord starts talking to me and I start writing them out. There's other times when Holy Spirit will take me into the scriptures and have, have me do word studies and research very intensely and he's there with me. He's teaching me by revelation. Both of those are words of God and prophetic. You believe that? So just because I have a manuscript this Sunday and I didn't last Sunday doesn't mean that last Sunday was more anointed than this Sunday. Can you receive that? Because I've sat with Holy Spirit all week. And I believe I have a message for you that is a, in preparation for what God is about to do in our church and Connie Sprouse. Good to see you, sweetheart. Haven't seen you in a long, long time. I want you guys to go hug her and give her a great big welcome back. I'm so glad to see you today. Yeah. And then I see some new faces. I should, I should pause just a second and welcome our guests. How many people here who have not been here before? I just, welcome, you guys. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. I'd love to meet with you guys after church, get to know you. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Uh, and um, you guys saw the little hands in the air, so just be sure and give them a great big radiant welcome, okay? All right. I believe that the, the purpose of this message today is to prepare our hearts specifically for next week's broken walls. The, in, the, 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 American, the North American, I was, I'm trying to get this right because I, 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 I want to understand and say it correctly. North American First Nations will be here. And they will be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in their cultural context. They will be, I believe, instrumental, used by Holy Spirit to break some cultural barriers that need to be broken in our religious hearts to establish a bridge... Because I believe that we are at a pivotal point in Christian history where it's time for the church to adopt ourselves somewhat or at least be appreciative of the cultural context that we live in so that we too can be wall breakers and bridge builders to reach the people in our city. And for that reason, that's why I believe this is a forerunner message because I believe it's not just a message for us in preparation for what's happening next Sunday, but it is a message I believe that you're going to begin to hear more and more and more because it is, is, a, it is a get out of the church and get to the world message that God is imposing upon his church in this hour. Okay? I believe God is giving, going to give us an opportunity immediately this Sunday, next Sunday, for the Lord to begin to lead us into the new season that we as a corporate and the ecclesia is going to be led into. The church is being called and equipped by the Holy Spirit and has always been called and equipped by the Holy Spirit to be missional. Missional. We've been called to be missionaries, as we would say it. 
Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the good news. Mark, Matthew 28 says, Go make disciples of all nations. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and says, And you will receive power. This is Jesus saying this to his disciples. You will receive power when Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the what? Uttermost parts of the earth. And then when Holy Spirit came upon them on the day of Pentecost, and they heard the good news preached, the people were there, and they heard the langu- in their own language, Peter prophesied there, he said, that out of the book of Joel, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so what's happening here is they are, all of a sudden, the, the Jews are unto themselves the people of God and all of a sudden God's opening a door by the power of the Holy Spirit and he's having them lift up their eyes and see the nations it's a very powerful moment not just the empowerment of the Holy Spirit but an opening of the spiritual eyes to see something that they've not ever seen before the reality of their calling and their purpose as the people of God. And they really didn't understand it at that moment. It's going to evolve. They're going to get a revelation of it. So we as a people, this is what these scriptures are saying, we are called to be missionaries. We have a missionary calling on us. And the early church in that first century immediately or almost immediately after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, persecution hit. By 70 AD, there was tremendous persecution upon the church. And the church was scattered to the uttermost parts of the known world at that time. We have history of where, where each one of the disciples went following in, 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 in a result of that persecution. It says that, you know, Peter's whole world was turned upside down when he was upstairs praying. And the Lord opened a vision to him. And he saw things on a sheet let down. And he was called then to go to the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. He can't figure this out, but he goes. And the Holy Spirit is poured out on the house of Cornelius, upon his family, just like it was at Pentecost, and here, there, here they are, Gentiles. This is mind-blowing for Peter. And then we have Stephen is martyred, and, and Saul is there, and he watches it. And then we know that the conversion of the Apostle Paul, who says, I'm a Pharisee as a, of the Pharisees. He was converted. And then he receives a call to go take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the salvation, the good news of God, to the Gentiles. The church of Jesus Christ was born to be missional. We're called, anointed, appointed, empowered, given authority to reach all people. Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world and the, testi- and the testimony to the nations, and then the end will come. And then in the book of Revelation, we see around the throne, people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, a, a, a number of people that is without number that are there worshiping the Lord. <clears throat> Now, there's something that missionaries face. It's a word called synchronism. Have you ever heard that before? Synchronism. This is when the gospel of God's grace that comes to us by faith through the finished work of Jesus, that's how we're saved, by through grace, by faith, through the finished work that Jesus hung on the cross. He was, he was crucified. He went into the pit, came up with the keys. He ascended to the Father, and then he sat down, and he won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. Amen? And his victory is our victory. That's the message of the cross. 
That's the message of the gospel. Anytime that you have anything in addition to that message, it becomes a synchronistic gospel. Anything you add, anything that you, you have to add or take away from that message, it's, not, it's a perverted gospel and it's synchronistic. So in other words, let's say an example of synchronism is when we were in China, maybe they would add ancestral worship with that. Or let's say um, you, you, you give the gospel to a Hindu and they add Jesus with one of their other many gods. Okay? So it's, it's a pollution of the gospel. And this is something that missionaries are aware of. Now, there's a difference between synchronism, adding to the gospel something else, some other religious thing, and contextualizing the gospel. Missionaries have to know how to contextualize the message of Jesus Christ. For example, Hudson Taylor in the 1800s, he was a British physician who went to China. And when he got there, he had his long black jacket on, his long black coat. And in China, at that time, even through the Cultural Revolution, everyone drew, wore the same thing, these blue outfits. Every, everybody dressed the same. And so when he would come and try to talk to them about Jesus, he's completely different from everybody else. He's standing out because he's got this long black coat on. They called him the black devil. He did something that no missionary had done to that point. He put on Chinese clothes. He let his hair grow long and he braided his hair so he had a pigtail and he shaved the front part of his head. And he went to them with the same message of Jesus Christ in their culture so that they could receive him. And as a result, he developed the China Inland Mission with 125 schools, 300 workstations in 18 provinces with 800 missionaries. He was a very, very successful. Anybody that knows anything about missions in China, they know Hudson, about Hudson Taylor. See, the problem with a lot of American or Western missionaries is they require indigenous people groups to adopt our Western style in order to be saved. As a matter of fact, one of the early missionaries in America, the saying was, kill the Indian, save the man. So in other words, they had, we, we required people to come out of their cultural context in order to receive Jesus and help them to look like us, which is not appropriate. Today, we understand that as missionaries. We understand the importance. We learned from Hudson Taylor, and we understand a lot of, a lot of missionaries. That's not to say everybody, but as a missional church at large, we understand taking the gospel to them in their context, but not changing the message. So let's look. John 10, 16 says, Jesus said, I have sheep which are not of this fold. They also must be brought in and they must hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Different culture, same Jesus. As missionaries for 10 years, Bruce and I understand what it's like to go and worship among other people that we can't understand a word they're saying because they're speaking in a language we don't know. But I can put my hands in the air and worship because I know the pastor and I know the message he's preaching. And I know that, he, that those people love Jesus, that you can feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So I, what I want to do this morning, in the next 15 minutes, 
give you an hour message where the Lord took me to Scripture because what I'm telling you needs to be based on Scripture. Is that right? So he took me to the book of Galatians chapter 2 where Paul is struggling with the Galatians. Now, this is a cyclical letter that went to the Galatians and then went to other churches in Asia Minor. And there's a bunch of Judaizers that come in. Now, Judaizers are people who have heard the message of Jesus, and they are, if they've embraced the, that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, but they are also adding to that the law and circumcision so in other words, Jesus, plus you have to obey the, Mo, the law of Moses, plus you need to be circumcised. So here these Judaizers are coming up from Jerusalem, and they are preaching this message of Jesus plus Judaism. You have to, you can't be, uh, function like a Gentile. You have to come out, and you have to be a Jew in order to be saved. Can you see what I'm saying? That's what a Judaizer is. They're trying to bring Gentiles in and make them Jews. And if you're going to do that, then you have to follow the law. And so what we've done here, they're mixing grace, God's amazing grace that only comes through the salvation of Jesus Christ, and they're adding to that you have to do a little bit more work. That's syncretism. You see that? Do you understand it? I meant to put a bump. A, have you ever seen those bumper stickers, Coexist? Yeah, that's, that's the epitome of synchronism in our world. So anytime we see Jesus plus anything, that's a perversion of the gospel. So in this letter to the Galatians, Paul all of a sudden mentions Antioch. Out of the blue, he just mentions Antioch. And he was talking about Judaizers who came to Antioch. And he said, Peter was there with me. And at this point... Peter, he got so caught up in these Judaizers that he quit eating with the Gentiles and he, he drew himself aside and only ate with the Jews. That's how convincing they were. Peter was led astray and Paul said, I rebuked Peter to his face and said, what do you think you're doing, guy? You're perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one way, not the law. You don't add the law to it. You don't add anything else. You don't add any works to that. There's only one way, the gospel of grace, and that's through Jesus Christ. Okay, so that was the, the, the book of Galatians. I want you to fast forward in time now, and you would need to go to the book of Acts chapter 15 to get the rest of the story. Paul Harvey's. How many Paul Harvey people do you remember? The rest of the story. So you come to the book of Acts, and it's three years down the road. Peter is there with the Jerusalem council. The issue of Antioch still hasn't been settled. Paul is still just really struggling with these Judaizers that are there in Antioch. And so they decide, the church decides, we're going to send Barnabas and Paul down to Jerusalem to talk to the leaders in Jerusalem at a Jerusalem council, get alone and find out what, we're going, what we should be doing. Because we're ministering to these Gentiles, and the Jews are trying to make them become Jews. And Paul was saying, that's not what we're supposed to do. That's not my mission. That's not what God wants me to do. He wants me to preach the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles in their context. And he's getting, he's getting hammered by these religious Jews. And so three years later, he takes a trip with Barnabas down to Jerusalem to talk to the council of, of, in Jerusalem, the church council. James, the brother of Jesus, is the head of the council. And we've got Peter there also. And there are some Judaizers that are there in the mix. And so they, they're going to talk about this issue that Barnabas and Paul have come down from their mission field to get settled once and for all. Are you guys following me? So the Judaizers stand up and they declare, the Gentiles have to be like us. They need to obey the law and they need to have, be circumcised. 
They listen to them. And then we have Peter that stands up. Peter learned his lesson three years ago. He stands up and says, The Lord called me to preach to the Gentiles. I went to the house of Cornelius. And before I was able to tell them the whole story about Jesus, the Holy Spirit came on them like he came on us in chapter 2 and baptized them with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues, just like we did. So Luke is recording this, very summarizing. You got to read between the lines. And then, and, then, and then next, Barnabas and Paul stands up and he says, God sent us to the Gentiles. We've been preaching through all of Asia Minor. And we have seen multitudes of Gentiles come to Jesus and mighty miracles. And then James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the council. He quotes from Old Testament, two Old Testament passages that the Gentiles will come to faith. And then they made the decision that became a pivotal point in the book of Acts. That Gentiles are not required to become Jews in order to be saved. Just like the Chinese don't have to become American to be saved. The people in Africa don't have to be American to be saved. They don't have to look like us to be saved. And they make the decision that, that there is no other requirements to be saved no law that they have to be under except this is it food sacrifice to idols meat that's strangled and what that's referring to is idolatry idolatry in their culture we don't want to mix idolatry this diana worship and all this other stuff that's going on offering food to idols and then eating that food that's through that's that has to be put away because that's syncretism and the other one was tell them to abstain from sexual immorality in other words you have to be moral you still have to be moral Jesus died to deliver us from immorality and from sin and all the junk that the world wants to draw us back into That's not putting a requirement on salvation. You can't be good enough. Flesh is born of flesh. Spirit is born of spirit. We have to depend on the transformation power of the Holy Spirit in us to be able to conquer sin in the flesh. So adding, that's not talking about stay away from sexual immorality. is not saying you have to add your goodness to salvation in order to be saved. It's saying sexual, sexual purity will come out of your union with Christ as you become one with him. Do you understand that? So that was the decision of the Jewish council. They rejected synchronism. They rejected adding anything to the gospel that would pollute the gospel. But then you get, this is really interesting, and I'm going to try to hurry here. I think this is important. You you scan forward at chapter 17, you scan forward chapter 21 of the book of Acts. Paul, all of a sudden, he's there in Jerusalem, and there are Jewish Christians there who are saying Paul has gone to be with the Gentile, he stopped being a Jew. And Paul is saying, I'm a Jew and I've always been a Jew, but I'm a Christian Jew. And so for the, for the Jews, Jews, the Christian Jews in Jerusalem to accept Paul, the Jerusalem council suggested that he go with four other guys who have been on a Nazarite vow and he is he goes with them to their end of their vow and, and with their puri- join in their purification process and pay the money for their purification. Why did Paul do that? Because Paul, he, did, he, wasn't, he wasn't adding to the gospel. He wasn't saying, by doing this Nazarite purification, that's how I'm being saved. He was saying, I'm a Jew. 
I still believe in the Jewish feasts. I still do the things that a Jew does in my context, but it's not to get me saved. It's not for my salvation. So you see, what Paul is doing there is he's helping us to understand. Holy Spirit is helping us to understand. We can still live in our cultural context. With the things in our culture and still be a Christian and not add anything to the gospel. It would be as if I would say, I, I, I'm going to fast this week, but I'm not doing that to get something from God or to be saved. It is because I am laying myself out to the Lord. Does this all make sense to you? Am I making? Good. I knew it was going to be a heavy message, a heavy meaning, hard to follow maybe in a little bit. But what I'm trying to say, the bottom line is this. Would you pull up 1 Corinthians? I mean, I, I should have asked you to do that. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. So if I could say the bottom line of all of this for the Apostle Paul is, is this. He's not saying obey and do all of these things for your salvation. Good, here we go. All right. Paul is saying, though I am free and belong to no one. Is it up? Okay. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jew... I have become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I am like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. That's the tie that pulls everything together, what I'm saying this morning. This is the heart of a missionary. This is the heart of the Great Commission. Paul is saying we have to adopt, adapt and contextualize to the culture. We don't mix law and grace. We don't do a mixture of this stuff. The key is adopting and accommodating ourselves to the, cult, the context so that we can reach people, break down walls, build bridges. Now, Paul didn't say, I became an adulterer to reach the adulterers. He didn't say, I became homosexual so I can reach the homosexuals. He didn't say, I became a thief to reach thieves. It's not what that's saying. We still have the moral laws of God that we obey out of our new nature. Those still hold. We still don't kill babies. Amen? We're not under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ. Would you put Mark 12, 28 through 31 up for me? I'm sorry. To, I'm, put, I'm, I'm putting a little pressure on our people upstairs. Can we say thank you, people? <laughs> yeah, amen. Thank you so much. Okay. Of all the commandments, they're asking Jesus this, which is the most important? 
The most important one, Jesus answered, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no condemnation, there's no commandment greater than these. That's what I'm talking about. Love people where they are. Go to them, reach them with the gospel. Don't ask them to change out of their culture. Don't ask them to change who they are. Jesus will change them in their culture because he loves their culture. We don't have to be, everybody doesn't have to be American. That really was a failure of the American missionaries, even though we're the greatest sending missionary country in the world, although there's other countries that are eclipsing us at this point. But we were. Our failure was we tried to make them American to be saved. Bob Jones Prophet Bob Jones, he's in heaven now, but, but he died at one point while he was still on earth. He went to, and he saw the Lord face to face, and the question Jesus asked him, have you learned to love? Have you learned to love? And he had to admit, he hadn't learned his lesson yet, so Jesus said, I'm going to send you back to earth for a little while longer, and your mission is to learn to love. When he went home to heaven, it was on Valentine's Day. And people would say in his last years, he'd learned to love. So why am I saying all this? I feel like the Holy Spirit again is asking us to open our hearts to a different culture next week when they come with their flutes and their drums and their different dress. And we're going to celebrate Because they're going to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ in their context. They're not going to compromise the message of salvation. They're not going to mix other religions in with it. They will contextualize their method to reach their people with the message of Jesus Christ. Different method, same message. Amen? Religion and legalism too quickly rejects cultural customs and alienates people when in reality God has called us to be missional and to build bridges. It's okay to change the form. We don't change the method. I'm sorry, we don't change the message. We can change the form. We don't change the message. Amen? So this is our growth opportunity because I believe this is where God is, as I said, not just leading us on a micro level, but on a macro level. This is where God is leading a church. Because we have a, we have a world out there that we can't identify with. But God's not asking us to make them like us. He's telling us to go to them and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward? When the Holy Spirit was poured out in revival back in the mid, whole ushers for the, yeah, for the communion. Some of you remember the revival of the mid-1990s. Prior to the revival, we had a choir and hymnals and an organ and a piano. Is that right? Choirs with their robes. And it was a great time. We loved it. It was a wonderful season. And then revival broke out, and there's a whole shift in the way we did worship. All of a sudden, the hymn books were put away in a closet. We started singing off the wall. Out went the piano, and out went the organ, and in came the keyboard and the drums and the guitars. The whole sound changed. The worship was completely different. God had something Different, not necessarily better, but different. We see people dancing, lifting their hands. 
not better, different. And I sense in my spirit, church, that God is about ready to birth a new wineskin. I haven't completely seen the blueprint, but I'm aware that it's there and it's being unrolled. And that which is born of the flesh is going to be removed and that which is born of the spirit is going to be birthed. So we have to be willing to move those shifts, to not get in our religious mindset and be held back. But we have to be willing to let the cocoon around us go so that we can emerge to the metamorphosis, through the metamorphosis that God has for us. I see these scaffoldings. Scaffoldings are about ready to be removed so that we can begin to see the church that is emerging. Church, We've got some exciting days ahead of us. We are missional, born for mission, and God has great things for us, and he's teaching us the ways of the Spirit.